uh, welcome to uh, this afternoon's uh, PTIC meeting. Um, we've got quite a lot on the agenda. Um, we have uh, apologies from Keith Sabin from Shropshire and John Austin from uh, Southend. Also, right. Peter Stoner, um, Tim, he responded to the minutes thing that he's having a party or something. I'd say world party. OK. <laughs> Rob Fair West enough. might join later, but he can't make the beginning, so he sends his as well. Who was that, sorry? Rob West. Oh, right. Lovely. Ta. OK, we've probably got a few too many to uh, go through. Uh, introducing ourselves but if we pop up and say something if we introduce who we are first time we do it that's probably uh the thing to do um so um last time we met was the 26th of september um and um there were i think there was only one um action from that which was dr j uh putting rob west into touch with um the user research team about a plus naptan you're on mute dr j it's okay i believe i did that rob i'm pretty sure i did that yeah rob's not on the call at the moment ah. but uh yeah you sounded very much like you were doing it there and then, Dr. J. I can't verify such things, but you sounded very active about it when I was watching oh. the video. So I oh, no, no, no. I'm quickly, I'm quickly preparing my update because I've had too many public meetings to, <laughs> to, to get the mural together. So I'm just quickly figuring out all the bits that I need to talk about <laughs> and just getting them quickly together. So, yes. No, but I did, I did put Rob in contact yeah, or I, I should have. Them. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, and there were a few um, opportunities for engagement uh, around uh, Plus Bus, um, Christmas data, um, and Bus Centre of Excellence, which, all of which will no doubt crop up during the uh, call this afternoon as we work through our agenda. So, uh, is there anything anybody wants to raise as matters arising or anything from the minutes? No. Okay, cool. Um, in which case, uh, we move swiftly on to uh, the Bus Open Data Service um, and uh, where we're at with the uh, current service and procurement and things like that. And... Uh, Triumph, I think you've you said you were gonna uh, talk about that. Yes, Tim. Yeah. Um, if I can get okay. my camera up, just give me a minute. Yeah. Can you see me? We can, can see me? you. Yes. Great stuff. I am <clears throat> going to share my screen. Apologies if I'm not looking at you. Yeah, um, we can see that. Thank you. Cool. Um, so I'd uh, provide a, a quick um, sort of um, update as to where we are uh, with the service in terms of, um, you know, procurement, um, but also um, <clears throat> some of the ambitions that we, you know, we, we committed to um, uh, at the beginning of, uh, of this phase of the programme or at least since the last time we, I gave one of these updates. Um, so with the procurement, um, as you know, we initially sent out a request for information in March, which was followed by a supplier day in May, uh, and we released SQs in July um, with the initial intention to, to go to ITT immediately after that. Um, that plan hasn't quite, um, you know, hasn't quite panned out um, purely because of you know, technicalities and um, sort of governance and, and, and a lot that we've we've had to do in that time to ensure that 
um, the procurement is is as robust um, as as can be. Um, as a result of that, we've had to um, sort of uh, republish the selection questionnaires again um, due to technical advice uh, that we received. So uh, the republished SQs were released in October um, for deadlines in November. Um, we have seen an increased number of responses uh, to that republished SQs, which um, makes my my job even more <laughs> than 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 it's meant to be. However, um, you know the current plan is for us to evaluate um, have governance um, on these. Well, evaluate moderate. Um, and come up with a selection of suppliers that we are going to take to the ITT phase uh, and then sort of apply some sort of governance to that, you know, selection process or evaluation process. And we hope to co um, complete all of that uh, in December this month. As we know, uh, December is, is a funny month for work. Um, so it is possible that, you know, some of that um, especially the governance bit, not so much the evaluation and the moderation bit, might slip into, into early Jan. Uh, that being said, based on the current plan, um, we intend to release ITT um, in January 2025 and follow the procurement process, you know, um, from that point. With most project plans, we've allowed some contingency because things do sometimes not go according to plan. Um, which you know we've got a lot of contingency for a month um but the intention is to go out to to itt um in jan 25. i'm happy to take any questions on the procurement at this point great i'll move on um <clears throat> so in the last meeting i talked about um, our intentions and what we have done around sort of um, a new data quality service, a new centralized DVL service, um, NCSD, uh, the development of a new devolved registration tool to ensure that in collaboration with uh, the OTC registrations data set, give us a, a single source of truth around registrations data. You know, all of that stuff we have developed and we've continued to iterate up until this point. Um, in terms of since the last time we spoke, you know, we have made significant, well, <laughs> we have been able to develop some sort of internal warehouse um, for historic BUDS data, for timetable and vehicle locations data going back to the beginning of BUDS. Now, at the moment, uh, the data that we hold is currently held in a manner that it only supports um, the program and program product, like ABOT, for example, um, <clears throat> as well as other departmental requirements, so our stats team and all of that. Um, we do have, or oh, we, you know, there is a consideration for making that, you know, historical data set available for, you know, third party public consumption. However, there are challenges around the volume of the data, uh, the cost of processing the data. Um, as well as uncertainties around whether or not um, sound bites that we are getting around the need and the requirement for that data being made publicly available would translate into sustained usage. Um, um, and as a result of that, we as a department are sort of going through a governance assurance evaluation of um, um, of that of that ambition around sort of publicly available um, 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 historic data set. Um, these measures are being actively undertaken, and once we complete this, <clears throat> we would then make a decision whether or not to commit uh, to to that piece of work, or and and decide you know how we commit to that piece of work. So how we make that data available, if it's something that we decide to do. Um, you know, at the moment we are appraising the various options and the various avenues available to us. And once that's done, um, I'll be able to come back to this uh, to this board and 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 give an update. <clears throat> um, as you know, in August we released uh, the uh, data quality service and the centralized well, the replacement of the centralized AVL. Uh, we call it IAVL. Um, 
integrated um, AVL service. Um, you know, that was to replace sort of incumbent third party, you know, solutions that had up until that point, you know, um, underpin bots. So now we've got a DFT owned open source, open code alternatives, so those third party alternatives. And since we released in August, we have continued sort of, you know, iterative improvements uh, on these services um, with ongoing work, especially from the AVL side of things. Um, focused on sort of developing subscription subscription API capabilities uh, for the new centralized AVL service. Um, NTSD, as you know, we've uh, transitioned in a way um, from uh, the incumbent process or incumbent, you know, avenue for um, providing coach service data set. Um, we uh, since August as well have released. Um, <clears throat> A coach service data, um, but you know, a, a coach data set service. Um, we have taken on board feedback from the industry as regards sort of you know the scope, the validity, you know, of the data that is provided as part of this service. Um, over the last few months, we have been sort of working with industry, taking on feedback to improve uh, um, how we provide a coach service data set. Uh, these data set will be uh, provided through BODs and in the very near future, um, you know, we are hoping that becomes the single source of truth from the department's perspective anyway, uh, for the provision of uh, coach service data set. Um, then there has been, uh, sorry, I should have taken that. These are not upcoming features. Oh, apologize for that. Um, <laughs> those are not upcoming features. These are features that, you know, have been developed and, and, and being iterated. There has been sort of the new ABODs. Um, so we have recently taken on the task of, you know, rebuilding um, the ABOD service um, and extricating ourselves from, you know, what could have been described as sort of suboptimal arrangements with uh, third party suppliers providing parts of the service on a sort of proprietary software as a service basis. Um, we wanted to bring all of that in-house to ensure full DFT ownership and control, um, but as well increase of openness, transparency, and <clears throat> engage the industry in, in building and the articulation of the logics and the algorithms that underpin the analysis, uh, the reporting and the analytics service. So we've built a new way, but, um, which is DFT owned, uh, you know, open code, op open source, open code. Uh, we have engaged with the industry in terms of user research to uh, to 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 understand pain points, um, but we've also in, involved the industry in the articulation of the logic and the algorithms that underpin sort of reporting analysis and you know and, and performance um, um, of of the new service. User acceptance testing has just been completed, um, and it's garnered a lot of positive feedback. Um, in terms of how the new service is more reflective of what operators and local authorities understand to be the running uh, on the ground. Um, there are still a few things we need to do, primarily around the retrospective um, application of this new logic and alg algorithm to historic data sets um, that we now have in our warehouse. Um, and one or two other things that we would like to do. And once that is done, um, we aim to launch that service uh, sometime in quarter one of next year. Um, but that's where we are. Then once we launch that service, you know, there are, you know, there are additional sort of features that we want to add to that service around sort of detailed compliance metrics, um, uh, compliance and data quality metrics to ensure that you know, we are providing to bus operators, local authorities, and other users of the service um, as complete a picture as they can get um, insofar as understanding, you know, what the state of their data on boards is. So that's something that is, is well, happened slash is happening. Um, then we've got some ambitions around working towards an aggregated cancellation data set. Um, initially and primarily from the big five operators <coughs> to enable us provide real-time updates uh, on BODs. Um, 
the success of this work is relying on voluntary participation um, from these you know, operators and their cooperation, which so far has been you know, relatively positive. Um, if that positivity continues in sort of the, the, a similar vein, then um, with you know the cooperation of operators, we aim to launch, you know, that somewhere between say, you know, end of quarter one and end of quarter two, um, um, next year, and hopefully you know in addition to the real time you know you know um, schedule and 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 vehicle locations data we can then be providing some sort of you know um cancellations data um as well um to ensure that you know the data set that is being provided on boards is um you know a lot more robust and a lot more valuable uh to the consumers of that data and the various use cases for which they consume that data um we continue to make improvements to the devolved registrations portal or the ep registrations portal um to ensure continued and improves uh, data accuracy and completeness um, um, as long, along with sort of, you know, improving the interactions with, you know, the various digitized elements of, of registrations data. Um, one of the big things that we hear from, from you know, the industries, um, you know, the availability of a trans exchange tool and the current trans exchange tool um, you know, not operating as optimally as users of that tool would like the tool to operate at. Um, as you may know, um, for the past year to 18 months, we have been committed to providing um, an alternative tool through um, Powys County Council and Kudagatin um, um, due to procurement uh, technicalities within you know within the department um that avenue is no longer available to the program um unfortunately so we now need to you know go back to the drawing board and assess you know what options are available to us and part of this assessment is you know the department conducting some sort of you know um industry research governance assurance um um uh, on you know, on trans exchange tools and, you know, and where we are, um, and as well as evaluating the various options that are available for us in terms of providing a trans exchange tool to the industry to support the publication of timetables data to bots. Um, these are ongoing as well. Um, and hopefully, you know, once we we undertake all of this robustly, we can then ensure that we are making a, you know, uh, an optimal decision around how we provide a new improved um, uh, trans exchange tool that meets, you know, user needs effectively, but also the ambitions of the program and and the department. Um, so that's that's where we are generally. I think that uh, on a high level, um, you know, a brief summary as to. Um, <laughs> you know, changes um, uh, since the last time that we, we had one of these meetings. Um, happy to take any questions. Um, and, you know, um, hopefully those questions, you know, invite conversations that we can have on a, on a more granular level. Thank you very much. Thank you, Triumph. Uh, Nick, you've got your hand uh, up. Yeah. Trying to find, I, I continue to be blown away by the sheer amount of work involved. It's absolutely amazing. On the trans exchange tool, um, and I know it wasn't terribly easy for some operators to use, uh, has the department considered the alternative of tendering a, uh, a service that could be provided by a third party, a timetable system creator? Where they provide a sort of a uh, a simple interface under license, which uh, smaller operators, community transport, etc., could use. Yeah, that's an option that we haven't ruled out. Like I said, we have evaluating all the other all the available options to us, um, and part of that evaluation is also evaluating, you know, how that fits into <laughs> the current backlog and workload uh, that we have considering yeah. the size of the team um, and all of that um, 
you know, um, if we were to run a procurement like that, then maybe that would be after run the procurement yeah. for boards and a boards because you know we've got we've got a lot happening. Um, I'm not saying we have a position because we don't, and I'm not ruling yeah. out anything. I'm saying it's an option that's available to us. Yeah, and we would evalu evaluate all the options based on thank you various criteria. Absolutely, um, yeah. Nick. Okay, uh, Dan. Hi, yeah, uh, Dan Saunders here from Basemap High Triumph. A couple of Hi, things Dan. really around like, the ABODs and the redevelopment of that tying into the DFT data warehouse. So we've always had a bit of an interest in getting access to historical AVL data. As you say, it's quite expensive to uh, store all that um, yourselves um, and for us to do that. Is the change in ABODs going to allow any of that data to be opened up to non-local authorities? Because it'd be quite useful for the private sector to make use of that kind yeah, of punctuality data as yeah. part of it. Um, and I, my, when I've discussed this before, the kind of feedback was, well, the DFT data warehouse will start providing that historical AVL data. But it sounds now that, that might not happen due to increasing costs and things like that. So I'm trying to work out if there's some, you know, something else that might be happening around that that would allow us to make use of that data at all. Okay, so I, I think there are two questions there uh, centered around historic data, and I will take them one by one as I understand how you've asked them. So let's talk about the data warehouse. Um, we are not ruling out the provision of a publicly available data warehouse for historic data. Um, we are not, not at this point anyway. Um, what we are saying is, you know, there are implications to providing this, and we need to assess these implications against you know, cost and other sort of departmental objectives um, and perspectives within the department. And we will then decide whether or not and how we make that available. Um, there are different options for making the data warehouse available if that's something we decide to do. Um, and, you know, it's just evaluating those options to inform a decision. So I may well be coming back to you in three months time and saying, we've <laughs> developed a warehouse and it's completed. Or I may be saying, well, you know, this is how we're going to make data available to you. You know, it, it's still work in progress or thought in progress, um, you know, more, more aptly. Um, so that's the first one around the data warehouse. We've got, you know, it's part of our ambition. Um, you know, we, we understand the value of, you know, providing historic data and the various use cases that can support, you know, innovation, research, all of that. It's just, you know, making sure that we make you know, the most robust and optimal decision around how we go about doing that. So that's the first bit. The second bit around ABODs, you know, opening ABODs, there is appetite for opening ABODs externally, understandably, and even within the department, you know, there are people who, who make, you know, reasonable arguments for opening up ABODs to, uh, to a wider audience. Uh, however, there are considerations that, have to be considered if that um before before we 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 make that decision it's a decision that we we are thinking of or maybe not thinking of doing but evaluating you know at the moment um but there are other other stakeholders who've got you know who've got a vested interest in in ABODs being publicly available um and we have to consult those stakeholders as well um bus operators local authorities in all of those. And once that is done, I will be coming back to this board and saying, this is a position on opening up ABODs. We don't have a position at the moment. Either way, um, we are thinking of it. Um, but until we get a definite position, the current position remains the current position. Um, does that does that make sense? And does that answer your question? Yeah, I think so, Triumph. I think it's more, um, it'd be good to know, especially with the historical AVL data from, you know, do we, do we want to start investing development resource at base up to start collating that data ourselves and building that out ourselves or if it's something we know that in three months time or six months time is going to be done by the dft we don't want to waste that development resource known that it's going to exist so when you're in a state of limbo it's quite hard to, to make a commercial decision of where to to put that resource to do something so i think it's yeah it's that kind of knowing if it's a yes that's great uh, and it's going to happen you commit to it fantastic if it's no that's fine at least we know we can build something as part of that but it's a it's a state of limbo that kills you so yes i guess the, the sooner we have an answer uh, the better thank you you're most welcome Dan. and i think linked to that if if others 
would have a a business case for accessing that then that's perhaps something that might be helpful to triumph to understand you know what people's use cases are for access to that and you know whether i don't know uh throwing it out there there was some sort of commercial arrangement that might be you know possible for for access to it to cover the the costs of uh of, of data transfer and things like that which would be substantial you know so uh, so if you've got cases like that then uh you know drop triumph uh an, an email about that because um that might help him yeah okay chris hello uh chris sherry here from passenger technology group um i was just a question for triumph around uh, prioritization um i was wondering whether you could uh, just talk me through a little bit more around why um why you, you're deciding to spend um your focus put your focus in um tools about analyzing the data that's in bods over spending time on tools that help more people get more accurate data into bods to then analyze that if that makes sense okay so as I understand that question in the context of the presentation I have just given, quite literally is why have we prioritized ABODs of our trans exchange tool, for example? Um, yes, that... okay. in, the context, in the context of this presentation, yes, but it, I guess it's also more of a general question about other thoughts uh, around where where things are being prioritized in, that, in the context of good, lot, quality and quantity of data in versus how much you can then get out of what's okay. in there. I think it's it's not so much, you know, prioritizing one over the other. Um, you know, we we always had ambitions to, you know, um provide a service that, you know, um provides sort of reporting and analysis which adds value and is a benefit to the bus operators and the local authorities who, you know, who do different things with, with BODS data. Um, um, but we also, you know, we also understand, you know, that the quality of the tools available to publish data to BODS in a way determines ultimately the quality of the data that you, you have on BODS. And, you know, we have provided a create fares uh, data service, which is a robust service for the publication of fares data to bots. Um, the nature of AVL data does means that we can't, you know, we can't go into that space because that market is is very macho, and the way you know, the way the whole thing works, the inter, you know interaction with ticketing systems and all of that means that the DFC couldn't you know, couldn't get into that space. However, we did provide funding at some point um, uh, during the course of the program to, you know, provide CapEx to certain bus operators to ensure that they could procure the, you know, the, the tools and the services that was required to provide AVL services to bots. And we have here to provide a trans exchange tool. Um, the reason why we are where we are is because an assumption that we made didn't quite pan out in terms of how we provided a more robust trans exchange tool, i.e. always. Um, so it's not a case of prioritizing one or the other. Um, with most programs, you make plans, you make assumptions, and you know things don't go to plan. Uh, and the provision of the trans exchange tool is one of those you know, situations where we thought we had a very good plan and life just dealt that plan a blow. Um, and we have to go back to the drawing board and reassess our options um uh that's where we are but it's not so much a case of you know prioritizing one over the other we've got ambitions and and these ambitions we want to deliver on concurrently um whether or not it's analyzing the data on boards or supporting the provision of quality data into bots does that answer your question chris a, a little bit yeah i i guess i guess what um i struggle with a little bit is that putting data into bots is a legal requirement whereas yes. getting data out of bots isn't well, punctuality data is also a requirement, um, and you know the, the 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 primary one could argue, you know the, the you know a bot primarily allows operators to export that punctuality data and submit it to the government because there is a requirement for punctuality data. Um, so it's not a case of either or, um, but like I said, we are not 
more committed to one than the other. We are equally as committed on, on both sides. And once we understand what the options are, then <clears throat> we'll be coming to 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 a board like this and the industry as, as a whole as to how we think we are going to provide a more robust trans exchange service to, to the industry and how we'll continue to provide a more robust service for the other data publication services that we, we have developed and made available to the industry to use. Okay, thank you. You're most welcome. Okay, Dan again, and then we should move yeah. on. Sorry, uh, Triumph, one more quick question uh, regarding the trans exchange tool. Uh, was there uh, was there originally a NetEx Fair tool created as well? Uh, I can't remember if that was created, if, if, if that's used, or because we had the NetEx Fair profile update. I'm trying to work out if that trans exchange tool assessment will also take in the NetEx Fair tool, because I believe that's also had equally not great feedback on. When I first was mentioned to ages ago, I was just trying to work out if that's going to encompass the NetEx Fair as well um so are you saying you want to find out if there is a netex fair tool or whether you want to find out whether we have improved on the negative feedback the netex fair tool got it's trying so, to understand yeah so i i, I don't know I, I, ages ago someone showed me the netex fair tool that's been worked on before before it came out um, and i kind of heard and i haven't really heard much more since then uh, i'm trying to work out is that netex fair tool out there is it being used or, or, or anything like that yeah, we've got a create fair tool um, which supports the publication of first data in a NetEx, prof uh, NetEx standard and profile uh, uh, to boards. Unlike you, I'm not aware of, uh, you know, a, a general consensus as regards negative feedback uh, on that. If you've got more information on that one, I, I'll be very happy for you to. I, to I, send think that was, to me. I think it was more the feedback it would be good if the NetEx and trying to change tool as one because they're kind oh, of okay. linked to, together. Yeah, more than yeah that, else. that makes sense. That that absolutely makes sense. And that is also an option, um, you know, um, which hasn't been discounted, providing a tool that, you know, possibly does timetables and fares, but a lot of work needs to happen in terms of harmonization of standards to ensure that happens. Uh, like I said, we are evaluating our options to decide the the next best, uh, the, the, the next step, and to ensure the next step we take is the best step <laughs> that we can take um, based on what we currently know and, and the information that's available to us. Um, but the, net, the, the NetEx tool exists. I think it's a very good tool. Um, you know, in fact, you know, we 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 are hearing that, you know, a, a significant player in the industry might be looking at adopting that tool. Don't want to mention names at this point. Um, hopefully, you know, at the next couple of meetings, I'll be able to to uh, to talk more freely on that. Uh, and that, I think, is a testament of, you know, how good that tool is. Um, uh, so that's that. We need to start up the trans exchange bit. Um, if we then decide starting up the trans exchange means means we can do both at the same time and streamline that publication process for operators, then um, if that's possible, it's something that we might be looking at doing. But like I said, we are just evaluating the options available to us at the moment. Um, Thanks, Tom. Uh, Eva, did you want to come in? Your hand's gone up and down a few times. Are you? Yeah, I just wanted to support Triumph a bit. Hello, Eva Głowacka from KPMG. We are supplier to the FT. Um, Create First Data tool has been uh, went live in 2020 and it has been iteratively developed as being used by all small operators and some mm -hmm. medium and big, even big operators such as First Group. Um, Stephen Penn, who was who is a product manager, is on this call and he can provide the details. Um, it will be further developed for the multi-operator ticketing as per request from, from bus operators. Uh, it is the tool which uh, was the first. We now produce the NetEx uh, for first passenger used this tool uh, to um, end the code to guide their development for the first um, on the mobile uh, on the mobile apps. Uh, we've seen other smaller um, uh, digital services uh, who use the code to, um, to develop their businesses and their products on the mobile apps. Uh, we are also we also uh, have seen um, other 
uh, bigger players who are providing um, the the first uh, submission to 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 bots who extensively use the open source code to guide uh, their development and and uh, improve uh, understanding of the NetEx standard. So um, I I don't know where this confusion is coming from. Um, whether it is used, whether it is available or not, absolutely. Um, um, uh, sorry, the person Chris, Chris Sher, uh, from Passenger, uh, who asked the question, and and Dan Saunders, whether um, the CFDS can be used in combination with timetables is absolutely an option. Makes sense. Different options also make sense. Um, as Trump said, um, decision hasn't been made really how how uh, this would be progressed. Uh, but we are definitely talking to a variety of different stakeholders and users to guide us. And I think what is developed on bots, a bots and a backend service and a, a data generation tools follows um, government digital service, user research, both publishers and consumers um, we have evidence and we just simply follow it and we try to make it as easy for everyone as possible another one i just wanted to contribute to what Trump said on data quality uh, we do have and there are a lot of tools on bots um, for operators for local authorities to review the data quality and data integrity on bots. Um, we are constantly pushing and encouraging people. We, as department and the industry and consumers, we have aspiration to make this data as, as good as it gets. The question, Chris, analyzing um, versus data quality, uh, a lot of data and data analysis uh, highlights the data quality issues and data integrity as well. So this is one of the methods which we may, uh, which um, would we would love to highlight to to operators and consumers, and hopefully, you know, step by step, things will get better. Okay, thank you. And talking about uh, making things better, um, every now and then there are some uh, challenges and uh, errors and inconsistencies found in the PTI profile. Um, these things always crop up with standards. Um, so I've I shared with this group in advance of it coming out um through more formal dft channels to a what to the to the full user base there's a couple of application notes um that have been sent out one on dead runs so this is where you've got a positioning journey um from a depot you know first thing in the morning to uh, the start of its first journey or between uh, routes if they're not starting uh, at the same, uh, you know, one ending and, and the next starting at the same uh, bus stop. Um, you have uh, dead runs. That's very useful for real-time information systems because it allows for predictions to be generated before journeys start and things like that. There were various different interpretations of how uh, dead run start times should be interpreted. So there's an application note to clarify that and to resolve that issue. Um, there is also one um, around day shifts, which uh, so far the feedback has been slightly more controversial on. Um, I think it's fair to say. Um, so you know, day shift is where you might have a uh a journey that's in the early hours of say sunday morning but from a passenger information perspective you want it presented on the saturday timetable because people go out on saturday night and you know if you finish after midnight a lot of people will look at you know ah saturday timetable um so you know, it gets used quite a lot um 
So um, there was an error in the profile documentation, which meant that if you submitted it as per the profile, um, it was going to fail schema validation, um, a little unfortunate. Um, the feedback so far um, has been um, that actually uh, that's quite a problem what's being proposed, but so far all of that when I've talked to people at Actually, people think that we're stopping the use of day shift. Um, it's not. All we're doing is saying, please use as per the schema, which is an integer field. So putting plus one uh, as a day shift, if you're, you know, if you want to present a journey early Sunday morning on the Saturday timetable, um, you'd shift the day by one. Uh, don't use plus one um, because uh, that means it's text, not an integer. The schema requires an integer, so just use one. Um, but uh, there's a number of people that think that uh, that what that application note is saying is you can't use day shifts anymore. No, that's not what's being intended. We recognise that they're really important. It's just we actually want them to be able to be represented properly and correctly. So, um, has anybody got any questions or comments on those two application notes? Nick? Uh, could uh, could uh, the software providers uh, supply a tooltip or some sort of uh, uh, synchronized response so that unless an integer is put in, uh, it won't work. Uh, most of the tools out there, actually, Nick, only let you put in a, a, a one or a minus one. Um, it's just one particular uh, authority required their supplier to uh, follow the letter of the profile. Um, and so uh, so that's where the uh, the issue was identified. OK, in which case, uh, let's move on to another update. There's been an update to the FAIRS profile for BODS. Stephen. Uh, thanks, Tim. Um, yeah, there is uh, an updated version of the uh, NetEx profile for BODS, um, which mainly is related to removing requirements for stops in FAIRS stages. Um, but I think what's probably more relevant to talk about right now is some of you may or may not have received emails um, from the official BODS um, comms channel um, stating that complex fares, obviously complex fares were meant to be um, provided in 2021. Um, that's keep being pushed back. Uh, but we decided to go ahead and put a deadline for the provision of complex fares uh, of the 31st of March next year. Now, the profile already had um, sections in it relating to complex fares. Um, I mean, I probably should clarify that while the legislation lists quite a lot of things as being in complex fares, most of them have actually already been published as part of the simple fares work. Really, when we talk about complex fares, we're talking about um, post-pay products, product, products where the, the money is taken, you know, the price is calculated and the money is taken um, after the journey, either tap in, tap out, or by virtue of a, um, a sort of cap at the end of a day, end of a week. So it's these kind of products um, that we're expecting to see supplied by the 31st of March. Um, we'll start working with the major operators and their suppliers um, in the new year to try and push this forward. Obviously, this probably won't mean much to most small operators because they won't be operating tap in, tap out, and they won't be certainly be operating any sort of sophisticated capping uh, platform. Um, so yeah, as part of that, we will be extending the fares validator um, to add some additional complex rules to make sure that data being provided for complex fares is meeting the standard. Um, and then once the deadline has passed, we're going to start looking at a hard block for all non-compliant fares data. So that'll finally bring down the curtain, I guess, on the uh, lack of standardization of first data and ensure that everybody who's publishing is publishing 
um, according to the to the NetX profile. Okay, um, and a copy of that prof the updated profile document is on the PTIC website. Yeah, it might be um, helpful if you put that in the, the minutes maybe or share it um, after the meeting. Um, one thing I would say after the conversation about CFDS is, uh, you know, the CFDS tool has the ability to create caps uh, and complex netex and has done for um, over a year. Yeah. Uh, any questions for Stephen? No. Perfect. Okay, I will just uh, put uh, a link to the latest first profile in the chat. Okay, in which case, uh, let's move on to uh, Natan, Dr. J. Hopefully, you've uh, you've stayed with us uh, and are with and are awake all. enough. I'm awake, don't worry, I'm always awake at this time of day. Uh, I've just thrown the link to the mural that I'm going to present in the chat so you can add that to the minutes. Um, so what I was going to do is give you a quick run through the new stuff that I'm doing um, that's coming up and then just show you one part of A plus NAPTAM where we've been able to give you a little bit more sense of what's going on give you a few more examples. So something wonderful and bright and shiny to leave you with after I've gone through the oh my god rail moments. Um, I know most of you are bus operators and you really don't care about rail. However, we do because some of you do rail replacement buses. So thanks to PSV AIR legislation, we need to somehow, well, we need to get the data together, the data set together so that we enable PSV AIR on rail replacement buses. And this sounds ever so simple. Just have all the rail stations and do something around rail replacement buses. Um, I'm currently trying to get a list, a canonical list of rail stations. This is uh, actually quite a challenge and I'm working on it. Um, so we are working with the rail, rail delivery group, the rail data marketplace, the rail directorate, network rail, and most of the train operators. If anyone has any other contacts who they'd like to throw me, please feel free. I am open to any offers as to who I should talk to to get this list, because whatever list people <laughs> send me, they are missing many stations. Brink Cross West is the one to use. If it's not got Brink Cross West on it, it is nowhere near enough up to date for me to even consider. So that's number one. I'm trying to get the rail stations together. Once I've got the rail stations together, we can build the things under a rail station. Everyone's like, oh, because currently we only have three platforms in NAPTAN. I'm not even going to ask why we only have three and why three. Um, but we need many more than three rail, rail platforms. And we need that to bring in all the accessibility data for A plus NAPTAN. So that's something that we can work on later. The very urgent one is your rail replacement bus stops. Now, this is complicated and I'm going to give you a very high level overview. There are some railway stations that use local bus stops as their rail replacement bus stops, those will not change. That's all completely fine. There is nothing that needs to change there, apart from maybe the name that is given on the on the tan oh not the tanoi, on the AVL messaging thingy, because often those stops are not named for the railway station. So we will have to do a little bit of duplication. And what we're doing is we're creating rather than have duplicate bus stops, um, we're, we're creating this new entity uh, in the NAPTAN schema. How am I going to do this? I will figure this out. I will figure out how to communicate it to you, what it's called, whether it's a profile or whatever. I'm, I'm not going to do a new, a new version of the schema. Don't worry. Um, but it's going to be called RRB, and it's going to sit in the 910 in the uh, rail set of um, systems. And we're doing this so that... If you need to create a rail, if we need to create a rail replacement bus stop that is in the middle of a car park, and when they use it, they empty the car park, there is no way bus operators can think that that's a bus stop that they can start using on a daily basis. Because if you try to take a bus into a full car park, it will stuff happen, <coughs> bus gets stuck, life 
life is tricky. So we're trying to make it very, very clear what's a rail replacement stop and what's a normal bus stop. So there will be some overgoing shadows in a few places just to get the names right. Figuring out how that goes, figuring it all out, trying to get all of the data together. We are planning to start on this properly in January. Um, one of the things that's come up from looking at all of this which will impact a few people here, is rail station entrances. Um, these are currently managed by local authorities. And as you can manage, imagine um, there's a wide variety of rail station entrances. There's a wide variety of how they're done, how accurately they're done, if they're done, how often they're done, um, et cetera. And one of the things that we've found is even on the good stations, there's a number of entrances that are missed. So, for example, if there's after hours entrances and side entrances, they've not been included. There's only the main entrances, which means doing pathways and accessibility, et cetera, is just not possible. Sometimes those side entrances are where you need to go with a wheelchair and they're not in the system. So we're going to take those all somehow into the central part and there will be some migration happening. And I'm just saying I'm being vague because I haven't planned it out yet. So that's what's coming up in terms of rail. And the reason we need to do the rail replacement bus stops is for this PSV AIR legislation, which you all are working towards and you're all are working on. And we just need to uh, do that. And Nick, yes, that is a wonderful, wonderful thing. And why were local authorities maintaining it? That is a long historical question that we won't get into around the central managed versus the non-centrally managed pieces. What we're also doing with this Where's my nice little pit? Um, so we are going to get rid of the human as much as possible in the creation of rail stations, simply because it keeps on landing in my mailbox and I keep on having to edit HTML by hand. And quite frankly, I ain't doing that. And 2050 me ain't doing this either. So we are looking for the right feed from network rail or rail delivery or Darwin or whatever we have to use. We're going to get the right feed that gives us the rail stations. We can then build all of the information needed and have a human review that and press go to publish it. So there's a very non-human intervention in there and we're automating as much as possible. Um, does this, do we need a human intervention? Yeah, probably just to make sure that dates, go live dates are right and things like that. Um, so that's what we're going to do. This means I know there are some people who have been yelling at me saying, why does this rail station not exist? Honestly, the rail station doesn't exist because I cannot find anything about that rail station until you email me. And even then, there's only a 50% chance I'm looking in the right place. So what we're doing is we are just sorting this out because I've run the audit three times, twice now. There's going to be a third time soon when I get the new source of information. I've got to do it by hand because of some of the data matching problems and I'm not doing it again. So once we've got it and we've audited it, we'll be able to remove a ton of stations, correct the names of a ton of stations, and then fix this all up and actually have a NAPTAN data set that matches the rail stations out there in the world, all 2,800 or so of them. And that is going to be banging. Then we're going to get, as part of that, hopefully we'll get platforms in, we'll get rail replacement information in as best as we can, and we'll start working on rail station entrances. So. That is 2025's job. Also, while well, we're delivering A plus NAPTAN, so there's quite a bit going on with the team. Um, other things that are coming up, non-passenger stops. So these are the ones that people asked for from coaches and things like that, and for depots. Um, you've, you've all been asking for them for quite some time. We figured out how we're going to do them. We're going to reserve a little part of the echo code for these and make it a bit of a free-for-all. I'm figuring out the service design for that and then we'll be doing comms in January 2025 because I will need to get the DFT comms team to review my wording just to make sure that it all sounds goodly and I'm not using uh, J-style English. I'm using words that are much more um, considered professional for telling people, by the way, this entire block is going to be a free for all. But I wanted to give that to you, especially for the coach operators, for things like the stop on the M6 where everyone hops out and has a break and the driver gets their hour long break. It's not, it's a stop that's needed to make your schedules work, 
but it's not a stop that's needed to make for passengers to get on and off. So we wanted to distinguish between that. So we're going to have to get all of the journey planners to negate or to not publish triple nine stops. And I think this will also help Tim with his dead runs because the depot will have an ACCO code that they can run from, which will be a triple nine that they can run to their first stop. And that can be managed in bods, but it will not be one of the journey planners will be asked to remove anything that's a triple nine stop from what they publish off to passengers. So it's the most elegantly simple solution I could come up with. Um, there's also <laughs> NAPDAN data quality issues. Oh yes, oh dear, how much fun. Um, there, we've done some work on the active, there was active and inactive, which is the status, and then there's all, there was also a modification field. And there's a modification date and a creation date and a revision number. And the combination of all of those should lead us to a wonderful metadata world where we understand what everything is. Um, that utopian, that utopia is not possible. Um, so the, we're going to talk, we're going to publish out which fields are good, active and inactive, your status field, people are banging on that, that is really good. Modification, don't even touch it. Um, we have found so many issues with it and even on the calls that I'm about to publish, we had people have a look live as to what was going on with their systems and they found things like they incremented, they made a change and the, modif and the, the modification didn't increment or and the modification date didn't increment as they expected. Um, all of London is set to new no matter how many modifications they've had because that's a glitch with their system. There are so many software glitches. Every single local authority has had problems. We're going to, we're, I've called it data bankruptcy. We're going to come up with a better combination of words when the comms teams get on it. But essentially there's three fields that just don't bother trying to use because they're being overwritten or they're just not being written consistently. And it depends on your software version your software, your software version, and sometimes even um, other little bits and tweaks and which software version you've come from seems to also make some differences to some local authorities. So we've just went, so there's two fields that you can work with and the other three are just like, don't even attempt it, you will break your brain because there is no pattern. I tried to find the pattern and I cried and I then went and spoke to people and they discovered that there was no pattern. Um, and finally, because uh, this is also important, we're running a uh, one of the things that keeps landing in my mailbox and Bod's mailbox and everyone else's mailbox is a bus operator trying to talk to a local authority uh, and trying to talk to the right person. And honestly, I don't want 2015 me to be dealing with this. This should be a simple form that you fill out to go to the right place. Now, um, rather than us building a form, we had a look around and Fix My Street provides the right kind of form and that that we need and we're just working with them to figure out how we do it as DFT if um, and we're going to run a pilot on it using fix my street um, and if that works we will then look at whether we continue to use fix my street or we build something a little bit more robust and a little bit more more bespoke so we're trying out a pilot that doesn't take any coding from us to sort this out to see whether or not it works. And this will allow bus operators to just say, here is the postcode of the thing that I wish to report and it fires it off to the right person. Because that's actually a tricky thing to figure out. If somebody says, I want to report a fault on railway street bus stop, I'm like, well, which railway street, in which locality, where, if can you give me the postcode or something like that. So there's actually quite a lot of questions that need to be asked even when bus operators come to me or to BODS or it's come through from BODS. So we're like, if we can make this a form, it makes it a lot easier and it means there's no human intervention and it's going to go to the right place. If Fix My Street works, that's great. If it doesn't work, we know what we need to tweak and to make it our own. So we're taking a very much a, a trying to code as little as possible to to see if we can get this to work. So that will be coming and I will do some comms out to the ecosystem as well. And finally, 
because I'm trying to do my update as quickly as possible. Um, you all will have seen what we're doing for A plus NAPTAN. Our goal is to get Brenda to have the same journey planner experience as anyone else with her wheelchair. She gets the she gets the information to have agency and autonomy over her journeys, and that information is about the accessibility of the various parts of the infrastructure. Um, we're currently adding in visual cane, so we're able to not just do mobility wheelchair, we're also adding in visual cane users. So there's two types of users that the data can support, which is world beating <laughs> as far as we can tell, because most most places say, um, <laughs> most places are not quite as ambitious as us. They talk about wheelchairs, but they're only working on a single city or a single metropole, metropolis, nothing at all like us trying to cover three entire countries. Um, and the other thing that I just wanted to show you is I've been able to give some examples of how we do this inference. So um, we assess the street furniture either with human eyeballs or with AI eyeballs. They look at the street furniture and we store that street furniture and then we then use what street furniture there is to infer the accessibility. So here for user type mobility we have a true because we've looked at the street furniture and it's got hard surface and a curb so we know that that's enough for somebody in a wheelchair to be able to use that stop at a minimum and this street furniture has been assessed and it's hard surface with no curb that curb is minimal um, and it's too low for a bus even the kneeling bus to drop its ramp and to not have it so steep that a wheelchair user would struggle to get up or down it so this one is false and that's the sort of way that we're thinking about all of the stops that we're looking at. And I just wanted to share that because that's a new piece that we've put into the way that we talk about um, our work. And we are on target. And I don't think I showed this to you last time either. So this is what we're getting out of. And this was from a very first run of one of our, um, I call them AI eyeballs. Essentially, it's, it's how the, it's an AI system or an ML system that looks at an image and tries to find different things within the image. This has been really good with minimal training at finding bus shelters. So we've been able to see bus shelters, a bus shelter with a, with a sofa sat beside it because um, random, um, a bus shelter with its back to the street, which is the reverse of how London bus shelters are built. London bus shelters usually have their front to the street. There's some around the country that have their back to the street. Um, We've got some that have a little doorway. And one of the weird things of these is they're not, that particular design is not exactly as accessible for wheelchair users because there's very little room for them to manoeuvre in and out of. Um, and the thing that surprised me and many people, it can recognise parish some parish bus stops because parishes get to build their own bus stops in the style of the parish um, outside of a lot of the big metropolitan areas. And I believe as long as they have hedgehog tunnels, they can do whatever design that they like. Apparently hedgehog tunnels is the most important thing of a bus shelter and not the sheltering of the passengers or the safety of the passengers or the accessibility of the stop or anything like that, but hedgehogs matter. Um, but it recognised one of our, it recognised an, an image with a parish bus shelter. So we were very, very pleasantly surprised. And what we are currently doing is tuning up the AI eyeballs so that it's more confident. Ah, Nick, absolutely, hedgehogs matter. Um, although hedgehogs are hated in New Zealand because they're a noxious pest. So I'm used to thinking of hedgehogs as horrible things, and apparently here they're very, very sweet things, and I should, I, I, I should care deeply about them. Um, so we're currently tuning up our system to see things better and to be more certain when it's seen something. What we don't want it is, is it for, for it to hallucinate, which is the AI term for lie, for it to lie about what it sees. Um, so we've got a little bit of fine tuning to get it so that we're seeing things and we're not seeing things. We should have five to seven local authorities mapped out with AI, AI eyeballs and available in the API for testing by the end of January, probably before the end of January, but that's the date that the team have promised me that I will have at least seven of them. And in doing that, we're improving our workflows and our pipelines to make it faster, smoother, stronger, 
the six million dollar man type thing but this isn't costing anywhere near six million pounds um which is ridiculous for the level of work and the amount of stops that we're going to be mapping out so that's kind of where we're at um i will pause for breathing and leave you any questions oh and there's also our lovely little feedback corner with all of our contacts if you need them on that mural so i will stop sharing and answer any questions keith hello um two questions just out of your look at your ai i take it it's um good with floating bus stops because that just wasn't in your image no because floating bus stops are considered to be non-accessible. So what we've what we've had to do is we are saying only marked bus stops can have their accessibility uh, assessed because anything that's flex, hail and ride, or custom is canonically a piece of street, and we cannot guarantee the accessibility of a piece of street. Um, so we are only working to marked bus stops. That's a point that's made somewhere in there because I should have, and if I haven't, I will make sure that I do. But it cuts our number of bus stops from 400,000 down to 350,000 or something. There's not that many hail and ride flex and custom bus stops to take out. Oh, and we're only looking at active bus stops. Anything that's inactive, we're not looking at. So we're looking at active marked bus stops are the ones that we're going to use the AI eyes on. Everything else were a bit more like yeah, because it's a piece of street and the accessibility of a piece of street is wildly variable. Okay. And my second sense? question is a question which I probably asked before, but given that the DFT said that with regards to BODs, they were looking at how best to provide a trans exchange tool, a NetX tool, and whether they maybe put that out so someone could provide it on your behalf under license, blah, blah, blah. Have you reconsidered? from lessons learned that so maybe it's something that can be done with naptan still so then everyone's using the same tool at local authority and it will solve a lot of your problems for them with their suppliers and the consistency of data going into it etc etc um no because disrupting an entire commercial industry is not something i'm allowed to do because there are multiple commercial suppliers of those tools and they don't just supply information for NAPTAN, they often supply information into BODs, et cetera. Me completely disrupting that um, is not allowed. I am looking at the creation of a simplified tool for updating metro stations. That is something that I don't know when we would be able to bring it in, but we're looking at so I can devolve to local authorities the maintenance of their own metro stations. Um, and when when we tackle the absolute nightmare that is MPTG at the moment, um, and because you all had access to edit it, but you all didn't follow exactly the same rules for editing it. So there are some wild variations on how things are set up, um, especially where the centre of localities are and things like that. Um, w there will possibly be the return of a tool like that for doing it as well. Um, so those are on the horizon, but creating a basic tool. It was something we did consider early, early, early on, and um, it was recognised that our dis that we were not allowed to completely disrupt a commercial industry because that would that's not my job. My job is to take in the data that people can give me. Um, there are there's a lot of opportunity for innovation in the creation of those tools, and we want to make sure that there is good reasons for people to innovate their tools. Um, Given that NAPTAN hasn't really changed since the early 2000s, I think it's really hard to push for that for that innovation from NAPTAN. Um, not to dis, and this is no shade on 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 anyone who's worked on NAPTAN. But when I started in 2020, 2020, there was less than 15% of people on NAPTAN 2.4. It's now up to 47% on NAPTAN 2.4. So when it tips over to 50, 60%, we will start trying to push people to change. But we're also aware that a lot of people are on tools from the late 90s, early 2000s, NAPTAMINATOR, who ran on an ACORN 
computer is well and truly missed. Um, and we know that updating from 2.1 to 2.4 would be a considerable expense for a lot of those local authorities. So we're being very, very mindful and demure, thinking about how we make those changes. And that meme didn't hit anyone because you're all old and nobody got the mindful and demure. I'm not old, I got it. Thank you, Trish. Thank you, Trisha. You made me feel you made me feel seen for that moment. Um, Dan. Hi, Dr. J. Your question. Hey. It's, it's not really a question so much. Uh, is it the private beta for the A Naptan? Is that open to anyone to join? How private is the private of the beta -ness? Um So the private of the private beta -ness currently is anyone who's providing a travel or a journey planning role within the ecosystem. So our our private beta has is basically every journey planner that we can find. So we've got Travel Line, City Mapper. We won't move it. We're still trying to get them on board. Uh, City Mapper, um, TFL Go, Google. We want Apple. We're trying to negotiate with Apple. So essentially, it's a private beta for anyone who's doing the journey planning part because we want to make sure that what we're giving them is then able to be displayed to passengers. And if there's loops in that where they need to come back to us to change some of the schema slightly or validate how we're doing things slightly with feedback from their passengers that's where we want to be so we're giving them early access so they can take it put it through their test systems and show it to their passenger testers and get that feedback as to how their passengers are feeling about it that's the the that's the the people that we've got um, and we're going to keep it limited to that until we open the public beta. Um, that is simply so that we, A, so that we don't commercially prejudice anyone who's a journey planner, but also so that we really, really get that focused feedback from people who are taking this data and showing it to a passenger, showing it to Brenda and helping Brenda plan her journey. We want information from Brenda's and I can't get to it because I'm not a journey planner. So we're working with journey planners and and we're working with them to be in those conversations and figure out what more we need to do in terms of firming up our definitions and being clearer about what accessibility means. Does that make sense to you, Dan? It does, sadly. Sadly, yes, I know. I would love to give you access and I would love to let you have a play around with it, but we're keeping it limited to this because we really need that focus until we've finished doing nod across the entirety of the country and really started to get some of that value delivered of Brenda's, this has no value until some Brenda has it in her hand and is able to plan a journey from Birmingham to Bristol and find out how accessible it is. Until then, this this work has no no value whatsoever. In the strong, agile terms of value, not value in terms of learning, etc. Yeah, fair enough. Okay. Uh, uh, oh, wow. So, yeah, I think Jonathan does have the record for the most interchanges during a PTIC meeting. Certainly, Absolutely. I suspect people have travelled further mileage, but that's a complex journey with a bike. <laughs> uh, wearing well a jacket. Done. Also wearing a jacket, you know. So, you know, I it don't have a Christmas see. jumper, but I am dressed correctly. Uh, uh, yeah, you are. <laughs> Excellent. I didn't even plan the Christmas jumper. This was just today's jumper. <laughs> Because the, because Dolly Dolly is all year round. Dolly Dolly is not just for Christmas. Um, I have kept up with it, most of the meeting, but um, carrying a laptop in one hand and driving a bike with the other isn't isn't that easy. Um, <laughs> yeah. Is that it from me? I've stopped I, I sharing. I think so. Unless there's any more questions for Dr. J, who as ever has been uh, exceedingly busy in between meetings, the the energy never ceases to amaze. <laughs> okay in which case let's jump to travel line uh if mike is still around you've dropped off my list yes mike hello hi tim yeah thank you um afternoon everybody I'm mike nolan uh, customer experience manager at travel line and plus bus uh, the big update, I think, from our side, um, for the last six months, we've been working on our web services procurement. So that's for the re-procurement of the Travel Line website, the Journey Planner, Plus Plus website, and the Travel Line data site. 
Police have said we're in the very final stages of agreeing a contract with our preferred supplier. I uh, can't name them yet, but they are well known in the industry. Uh, we will be announcing that within the next couple of weeks. As like I said, we just do the final details in the contract. Uh, very excited uh, partner to work with. Uh, we're really pleased. It will see uh, significant improvements in the journey planning experience. So we'll be bringing in fares data, disruptions uh, information as well from BODs. Um, and also our vehicle tracking in there. So a lot of the things that customers have been asking for for quite some time will be incorporated in there. Um, and like I said, we should be able to make an announcement on exactly who that is um, within the next couple of weeks. But to uh, not to tease too much, they are well known in the industry. They supply a number of operators currently. Uh, so we're very pleased to be working with a, a kind of accomplished supplier in that field. Um, on the plus plus side, um, We've been running the e-ticket trial now in West York, West, uh, nine schemes in West Yorkshire, um, also in Cambridge and in Western Supermare. Uh, so we've had no issues reported in terms of the actual uh, purchasing of tickets and using of tickets. Uh, the tickets are currently in those trial areas are being used as a flash pass. However, in the last week, uh, we've had a successful UAT in Oxford working with Go Ahead uh, and Ticketer, where we're now able to validate and scan tickets, um, which is a major step forward for us. Um, the next stage on that is rolling that out to all other uh, kind of ticketer uh, users, but it's um, like I say, it does it kind of starts paving the way now for a national rollout. Uh, hopefully, uh, we're looking for that. Hopefully, um, in quarter one, quarter two next year, uh, when we'll see that out on the street. Uh, we're also working with Transmac, another ETM provider who can now decrypt the ticket. And again, we just need to work on the validation rules with them. But again, that's another significant step forward. Uh, and that covers then the, hopefully the majority uh, of operators in the country. There are other ETM providers we will be working with uh, in the new year um, to kind of, like I said, to pave the way for that. But yeah, hopefully we'll have some significant movement on that. We've also got, there's a number of retailers uh, currently selling the tickets, a number of talks uh, in the trial areas who are now uh, retailing the e-ticket, but we have got a significant retailer waiting in the wings, which we're hopeful in the new year. Again, they'll kind of come to, to market and that again should see a significant uh, step forward in, in that trial. So they're the main things from Travel Lighting that have been given us for the last few months. So any questions, uh, I'll back to you. Yeah, Dr. J and then Jonathan. You're on mute, Dr. J. You've fallen into Sorry. the technology <laughs> trap. <laughs> I I usually leave myself on a hot mic. Um, what I was just going to say is uh, I'm very aware that there are now two plus bus data sets. There's the one in NAPTAN, which is balked beyond balked, and there is one that Mike is creating. Mike and I have a plan. Once it's approved by our above stakeholders, we can talk more about the plan to fix up the two so that there will only be one, because there shall only be one, very Highlander, and um, how we implement it and all of that will be something that we magically figure out between us probably later next year and early onwards. But in the meantime, if you're doing anything with Plus Bus, do not use the version that's in NAPTAN. I cannot state this clearly enough. It does not match Mike's version <coughs> in a large number of ways or enough ways that it's broken. That, is, does that cover everything, Mike? I think so, Dr. J. Yeah. Okay, Jonathan. Yes, hello. Um, so Nextbus is, I'd like to talk about that, talk about that for a minute. Um, Nextbus is, as you I think all know, is a proxy to local authority systems for um, RTI. Um, if I just read out to you a list of places that have dropped off Nextbuses, uh, you'll see what the question is. Uh, Bristol, South Gloucestershire, Bath, Bracknell Forest, Warrington, Hartlepool, Darlington, Stockton, Redcar, Middles, Middlesbrough, Torbay, Dorset, Poole, Bournemouth, Durham, Greater Manchester, Kent, Medway, Northumberland, Tyne and Weir. Um, there's clearly a, 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 a lot of local authorities no longer integrating with um, Nextbuses, and so Nextbuses have lost a lot of coverage. Now, um, it's not in the hands of Traveline, it's, it's not a sort of blamey type of point, it's, it's, a, it's just really a question about what the future is for that kind of um, proxying into local authority systems. It looks as if it's, I don't know whether it's anticipated that um, you know some of the national service will be constructed or what, but um, I wondered if Mike, if you were conscious of that loss of coverage and what you're thinking about it was. Yes, uh, no, you're right, Jonathan. I think next buses is one of those, um, 
it's one of those uh, systems, like you say, it's, it's been set up historically. Uh, feeds drop in and drop out. And I think one of the things that I've now uh, tasked the team to look at is where we've actually got coverage and where we need to go and get it. Because a lot of the time, it's an authority bringing a new system and whoever previously provided the feed has left and that feed just kind of you know automatically drops out. They, ha they have got systems in these areas. I think it's, it is on us to go around the country, I think, and remind people that we have got this service, you can hook into it, and this is this is how it is. And it's quite straightforward. And just to give an example, we were talking with TFW um, last week where we are now looking at getting a, a Welsh-wide feed when we only had one in Cardiff previously. And it's been one of those things. It hasn't been front and centre, I don't think, uh, for us. It's just been something that's, that's there. It, it's uh, but it, There's a lot of people using that service, and I think it's on us to go out and find where we've got gaps and try and fill them. And where we can't be clear where we where and why we can't do that so yeah that's something we are looking at uh, but it's a service that we we plan to continue we've extended the, the existing contract for a couple of years so it's something that yes we will provide and you're quite right and i think if anyone's aware of any feeds that we should be getting do get in touch and we'll we'll go chasing those around i think it's just one of those things it's kind of been left to run itself rather than somebody driving it forward so it's it is on my radar absolutely that's really good to know because i thought your answer was going to be um, you know, it's it, it's going to carry on in that direction, uh, but obviously, when when you, when we we don't have Newcastle, uh, we don't have Bristol, we don't have Kent, we don't have Manchester. Um, that's quite big, um, mm. so um, more power to your elbow to uh, getting getting those feeds restored. If indeed, I don't know if there's anybody here from those areas. Uh, Ian's got his hang, hand up, so he might be able to to help. Yeah, a bit. No. I think just to finish on that as well, Jonathan, in terms of the future of it, we're, we're still unclear as well as to whether you know that might be something that Bods might pick up as well going forward. They have all, there's, there's been talk in various circles around Bods providing some kind of national serve, prediction service, but I don't know whether that, that is or isn't. But certainly we, we, we're, we're keeping this going for at least the next two years, so we need to get... Should, should Bods provide a national... Uh, you know, uh, should, it, should it enter more areas where it's competing with the market and where there's no market failure? That's yeah, a question we could yeah, leave hanging absolutely. in the air. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Okay, Ian. Uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Tim. Yeah, Jonathan, no, we, Lancashire don't have a real-time system anymore. There's a couple of operators that do, so they feed it in. So, yeah, we couldn't be amongst the, uh, the naughty list, so that makes a change for us, so we'll take that one. Travel line data. We had a... It's where the source is, is becoming a bit of a quiz at the moment. Uh, we had a complaint about a service is not being shown. And when it turned out, it, it was they were using the BODS data instead of the static data that's provided by a local authority. How does any how do we work out who's the services, who's providing the data that's live in Travel Line? Because it caused a bit of consternation and we've no idea how that actually uh, looks like in the field we i mean currently we only use data source from the regions so we we're not currently using bods data in in any of our output right okay minute. right okay that's a bit more complex then isn't it yeah right. yeah so yeah if you want to have a chat offline in more than happy to kind of look into any kind of specifics but yeah we're only using Currently using in, in TNDS uh, data source from from regions and in some cases operators. Okay then. Have we got anyone from Ito World on then who are providing Google? Uh, I don't think so. I think it's their Christmas do, um, but okay today, which is why they're not joining us. Ian, I. I think uh, you and I and Theresa met at a, a, a meeting that was splendidly held in Lancashire, uh, going back a couple of years. Meeting. Yeah, yeah. Um, we we're, we've been wrestling with this uh, on a big time, uh, mainly with Hertfordshire at the moment, but also in the past with uh, West Midlands Combined Authority and uh, uh, also with um, uh, uh, West Yorkshire Combined Authority. So we got. We could share with you what we found out, and it may be useful. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mike. Oh, yeah, I was just going to add something um, that um, I was just talking about with the travel line thing, uh, the data. Um, certainly in the Leicestershire County Council, they provide the data to travel line for, for Leicester and Leicestershire area. But I do know that they're, 
they tend to work behind times with a lot of the data. So that will mean that some of the data that you've got in, in travel line will be out of date for a period of time until they've got things up to date. So yeah, I I, I wasn't sure, I wasn't entirely clear whether you got your data from from local authorities and a bit from BODs, but yeah, now you've you've emphasized it. TNDS is purely local authorities. So if the local authorities be, is is a, a little bit behind get getting the data up to date. And obviously less I know Leicestershire County Council, they put their data in, I believe, longhand, so they type it all in rather than taking in trans exchange data from from operators. So that's why what another reason why it takes so long, I believe. So there's the, yeah, there are, there's, there's, there are, there are lots of hole. issues there. Yeah, there were the potential mm. potentially for, for 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 looking into, I guess, in the future. Yeah, yeah, and absolutely right. Yeah, I mean, in the case of we do take data direct from first and stagecoach, they're the two main operators that we take directly. But yeah, the rest All of right. it is is local authority source. So yeah, okay. right. Cheers. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, Nick Truscott, you had your hand up at one point. No, it's all right. Moments passed on okay. that one. Thanks. Okay. Uh, any more for Mike? No. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Um, and that then uh, brings us on to Christmas data. Um, always a challenge uh, to uh, to get it uh, in in time. Um, if you were going to try and make data available for the likes of uh, Traveline with uh, a bit of a look ahead for people to plan their uh, Christmas uh, journeys, then uh, the time has already passed, uh, being realistic. Um, there was advice published back in September about how to present this year's data and you know, what days were, were what in trans exchange um then um i don't know whether there's any problems or feedback about christmas data that we need to be aware of uh, this year in particular in an effort to try and learn from the challenges each year or whether christmas this year has been so swimmingly good after 20 odd years of trying to get it right that uh, we can all uh, rest easy next year uh, talking to an operator this morning, they're creating bespoke Tuesday schedules to upload rather than coding early runoff journeys to appropriate early runoff um, designation in the trans exchange. So it's still no consistent way in which it's being produced by at an operator level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the early runoffs are a problem um, if... Peter Stoner was on the call today, and no doubt he would say we need to do something about um, early runoffs um, in the way that it's expected uh, in the PTI profile. And I'm all ears to other ways of doing it to make it easier for operators who currently have to do things differently each year because Christmas moves. It's pesky like that. Just on that, Jim, last year for one of the operators I load data for, I actually man there was only half a dozen journeys affected. So I manually went in and just added mm. the early runoff designation to those trips. And it all worked fine in the real time system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just it can keeping be done. an eye on um sometimes I think it's just the the finer parts of managing the data is just not transferred down to those that are creating the data. Yeah. 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 For Lancashire Ops, we've uh, we've created a data set for the eaves. Um, it was the easier way to do it. Uh, extra timetables, I agree. And it's like several hundred files. But in order to try and confirm that it's going to be right, that's what we've been doing. Yeah. OK, um, yeah, Chris, uh, Sherry uh, points out a very good point. 2026 is probably the next time that it gets extremely challenging when Christmas holidays and uh, well, Christmas and Christmas holiday come into play. 
um, because of the way that uh, things fall um, around uh, weekends um, and that's when we had particular problems last time that cropped up so uh, yeah one to watch which is partly why I'm keen to try and learn from anything new this year so we can uh, get things bedded in before then okay uh, if there's nothing more about Christmas data um, accessible information regulations uh, had an airing from Dr. J, who is doing sterling work on rail replacement, which continues to be the biggest challenge with the accessible information regulations. So to remind you, this is where an operator has to have uh, audio, visual and hearing loop fitted to vehicles running local bus services. That means that quite a lot of rail replacement work is captured um, because any vehicle running um, less than 15 miles between pick up and drop off of passengers uh, is classed as a local bus service. So uh, rail replacement is causing the biggest issue there. Um, some exemptions were put in place um, for the fitting of equipment um that expire in 2026 um so there is a push on to try and sort out rail replacement um between now and then um there's a few parts of that one is getting the data sorted out um the first part of doing that Dr. J is clearly on with actually finding out where rail replacements stop um, I know that's something that uh, that Jonathan spent many a day trying to sort out a few years ago. <laughs> um, so uh, once you know where they need to stop, then you need to know the route that they're taking, um, which isn't always known significantly in advance. And one of the challenges with the audiovisual equipment is it actually needs to know the route that a vehicle is going to take, where it's going to stop, um, the names of those stops and how to pronounce them properly, um, because there's nothing that people hate more than a mispronounced stop location. Um, and at the moment, that means that the route and the recording of the audio needs to be done uh, significantly in advance and if you have kit from supplier A on one vehicle and kit from supplier B on another vehicle, that means you have to do it twice. So uh, the next bit of trying to sort out that data um, is um, how do we get to the point where if you've built a route in supplier A's back office, how do you get that into supplier B's back office? So uh, starting in January, um, Artig will be leading a bit of work with suppliers to uh, produce a uh, interchange format um, that will enable that route data and importantly the information about how to pronounce that correctly if you're using text to speech or if you're using a pre recorded MP3 file or something like that, how you move that between systems. Um, so that will enable all of the work to be done in one place and then shared between operators um, in a much easier way and make things happen um, much more easily. Um, and it's also not just a problem for rail replacement. Um, it's a challenge for some small bus service operators um, and so uh, we've got a couple of sponsors from uh, some of the uh, uh, major conurbations who are also interested in this where they um, might well be providing that bureau type service for small operators. Um, Ian? Right, uh, not wishing to cast aspersions on our operator friends but they're uh, their um, inclination to update their NAPTAN database to be up to date for their systems isn't something that's uh, a priority to them. So how does it go on when stop names change? Because Dr. J's put on about stop naming and stop naming is an absolute nightmare, as we all know. 
But how do they go on with changing names? Is there some sort of dynamic link where they will do the audio to update it or does it have to go through the process again? I can't actually get anything from our operators to say what they do. Well, so audio visual systems either do a text to speech job on it on the fly or you've got pre-recorded, both of which mean that, well, one of which is easy uh, to deal with because if you change a stop name um, and people do update data sets, then that should automatically be reflected. The harder one is where people are using pre-recorded um, stop names um, and that means you need to redo those recordings and things like that and that's going to be much harder for operators to um, keep up to date although it has to be said most of the systems being installed at the moment are using text-to-speech for just that reason um, so we have a loads of hands right Nick yeah, so we've had some experience about stop naming and updating stop names recently in that town and stop locations. But the reluctance comes back then from the operators to actually apply it in their systems because certainly at least one system out there breaks all their mapping of a service. If you change the NAPTAN, any of the NAPTAN details, so they then got to remap the entire service and it's just workload. Scheduling teams yep. are reduced. There's no capacity in the scheduling teams to actually do this work. Uh, and I do feel that some of the, the software needs to be more flexible so that if I don't know, you take a NAPTAN and you move it by millimeters in one direction, it shouldn't break the entire mapping of a service. The software should be able to just update that in the back end. Yeah, it just feels as though we're battling against some in some cases slightly behind software yeah yeah um yeah we we no. we religiously update every nap time request that comes from an operator they in turn then don't update their systems and i discovered this week that we had a school bus look at one particular school bus operated by one of our large operators and it wasn't tracking start and end of the journey at the school Come to find out, our real-time system was importing the operator's version of the stop location and overwriting the stop location it imports from Naptan every week. So I've asked our real-time mm -hmm. provider now to turn that ability off so they only use what they import from Naptan weekly. But I now have that question in my head. Out of 5,500 Naptan points in Cornwall, how many do operators have slightly differently in their scheduling systems? And it just should not be the case in this day and age of data APIs. Yes. Yeah. We will get there eventually, I suspect, but perhaps not for a while, unfortunately. Um, I mean, there are quite a lot of checks that happen in um, BODs, which perhaps could be used a bit more intelligently to you know repurposed to 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 alert some of these challenges um by comparing um you know what's in naptan versus what's being submitted if if there's a stop that's being provided by an operator that doesn't exist in naptan then that gets flagged and things like that but stop names and things like that perhaps you know there could be something you know. i think the more critical one is actually check checks and balances around the stop location if the latin long or the eastings and northings supplied are i don't know 20 meters out from what naptan says mm. that should be mm. flagging an alert shouldn't it because that means that the data all back through the systems is wrong somewhere but yeah you don't actually unfortunately have to have the location in the trans exchange file and you know, actually if operators are doing it right they just provide the the, the code, code the stop yeah. code um so yeah you don't unfortunately catch that um but uh, yeah that's certainly something to to have a think about and work with on the industry um keith uh it's just when you were mentioning about um the on bus audio and transferring files between different buses and so forth particularly the uh text-to-speech 
if you were doing names and photonics correctly, that would be uh, useful for actually on street displays as well. So they actually said the same thing. That was all. Yeah, yeah. No, you're absolutely right. There's a number of things that it'll uh, that it'll pick up. Um, so uh, yeah. Okay, Doctor J. Oh, I was just going to say uh, one of the last meetings, and I'm behind putting things up on YouTube, so it'll go up early next week. Um, was around stop naming and indicators, and between the two, I run two meetings, so there's four hours of meetings. Um, the summary is, ain't nobody got a good way of naming stops, and it varies wildly across the country. There there are uh, literally 148 different interpretations of the schema and how to name it. And one of the interesting things, and, and this is, I'm just raising it as something to go on my later pile, is there is a character limit within that 10, but the only place where it's really it, it's strongly enforced and that rolls backwards is it's strongly enforced in the CSV files. I want to change how people get to the data that's in the CSV file. You can still get a CSV file, but it won't be an auto-produced one. And that would enable us to look at increasing the name length. So I wanted to raise that as just a future thing to think about and come back to me with what's a reasonable length because it's currently stuck at 48 characters but I also believe there's some 19 characters and there's some short and long but weirdly enough common name and short common name have exactly the same length restrictions so come back to me and let me know what we would like in terms of length based on the systems that you're using and the systems that you're currently putting things in because if we're working to standards that were of the technology of the late 90s and what they could display compared to the lovely LCD screens and what or e-screens and what can be displayed now there's quite a variation and we can actually go a little bit longer if we need to and I just wanted to open that door to that conversation but also have people be aware one of the things that I am looking at is looking at the differences between common names coming from trans exchange and coming from naptan and highlighting where they're different and sending that and looking at building a report that i can send off to local authorities or bods can do the same either as long as one of us does it i think it's really important to let local authorities know where bus operators are renaming them because that's something that is driving everybody beyond nuts or beyond batty because people are trying to do the right naming and coming up with the right with a naming convention and then it's being overwritten which also means that your real-time information screens and the names on your bus stops and the names on your buses don't match and i'm just going to say old kent road tesco's dunton road it's one of those ones that that the front of the bus shows one stop the side of the bus shows one stop the stop you stop at shows one thing but the announcement and it technically shows a completely different stop and this is London, which is one of the better local authorities for being strict on and, and following conventions. And this is the stuff that's the stuff that I know that's out there. So I want to kind of get hold of it and show it to people and get a sense of how crazy it be. Does that make sense? Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does. It sounds like a very useful tool, Dr. J, because um, a little bit of work we've done picks up with what Nick had said um and, and there's sort of reasons why uh they're not necessarily the right reasons but there are reasons why uh yeah. map time fields are not used by operators and it's it's actually when they're developing their own systems and websites they will not use because they don't have to they've got their own stuff they won't they won't take in generally the stuff from the local authorities that has been naptan approved and you end up with two versions you shouldn't really have two or more versions of names for a stop but it exists yeah. in quite a lot Absolutely. of occasions yeah, yeah. And I think just getting a handle on it. So and knowing the size of the problem and where it exists and talking to people about those exceptions, where they're having to make exceptions for locals, be, even though it strictly doesn't adhere to the meta dating, the meta part of the schema, it strictly fits the schema. 
um, it's kind of like, well, yeah, it's good to call it after old Kent Road Tesco's because there are there is only one ginormous old Kent Road Tesco's and it's very much a landmark and Dunton Road is the tiniest of roads onto an industrial estate and nobody knows where it is. So it makes sense to rename to name the stop the wrong way round. And it's kind of like, well, how do you how do you ensure that that's happening in Naptan and it's and that's therefore populated through? Because I think there's a strictness that we almost need to throw away a little bit and make these very much Beryl and Brenda can understand where they need to hop off a bus and what and see what they expect to see. But that's just my rant of today. Yeah, no, I, I think you're right. I'm seeing thumbs up on the rant. So excellent. Sometimes <laughs> we lose sight of actually what is useful for the passenger. Um, so, OK, uh, Nick. Yeah, just on stop naming, I think what we find is operators have a lot of preferred names in their scheduling systems. My, the view we have taken with operators in looking ahead to publicity production for April next year is there's no such thing as a preferred name. If a stop is locally known as something, that's what the Naptan should be called. And we want to update all of our Naptans and eradicate preferred names full stop. Yeah. Not sure we've got the resource to do it all, but that's our plan. It's a great plan, Nick. Good luck. And I don't mean that in a nasty way. I just mean knowing there's lots going on. <laughs> I think we are fortunate in our two main operators are on board with it. So that helps. That definitely uh, helps. I, but I'd, yeah. I'd like to endorse that view and add to it by saying that certainly the work we've we've done suggests that, you know, e even in its present incarnation, Natan can support quite a lot. The work that Dr. Jay and her team are doing going to make it absolutely blindly wonderful, um, no doubt. Um, and we should not disregard the fact that uh, the bus driver, who is often the source, uh, really, really understands the passengers on her route or his route. And and so a lot of colloquial stuff is actually very, very useful and we, sh we shouldn't discount it. Uh, the trouble really, though, is that uh, everyone looks at the problem of changing Naptan and think, well, we can't bother the local authority because they're under-resourced and it will take quite a long time. We found exactly that uh, in counties we've worked with, that actually people go, well, let's not bother them because they're really busy. Uh, you can't improve something unless you give people a chance to improve it. Oh, exactly that. Um, yeah, we always say to operators, our door's always open if you want a nap tan changing. <clears throat> um, but the number of times they come to us with something they want changing is minimal. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. J, for that correction uh, about pronouns. Um, OK, Mike. Yeah, I was just going to mention, um, I seem to remember from the old days, uh, was this one of um, Roger Slevin's uh, sort of key things, if you remember <laughs> back to those days, uh, who's, who's old enough and been in this game as long as me. <laughs> yeah. uh, stop names have been associated with the side roads and whatnot but you know, which like like you say doesn't always work i know in leicester we've we've recently had renamed uh, the stop near the space center to space center rather than asda or byford road or whatever it was but for the same reasons as what dr jay just pointed out but yeah if you stick religiously to the to the the sort of gospel rule it doesn't always work so yeah i just thought i'd mention a name from the past but i'll i'll, I'll shut up now <laughs> cheers oh no 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 i've read the emails i know i know the control you've seen, you've seen that name. Control. Yeah. yes mm -hmm. yes good <laughs> yeah the equivalent of, of putting well, somebody on some... counting counting shells uh in the armory would be the job of properly documenting roger slavin's email uh, streams <laughs> of consciousness <laughs> If we did that, maybe maybe it'll be my retirement gift. I'll say, Nick, we found the perfect thing for you to do. Will you please go and document Roger Slavin's correspondence and turn it into a proper manual? Yeah. Not volunteering um, quite now. I, I believe there are some <laughs> stop names that have been redacted because they don't meet equality legislation. Yes. Very good. There are, yes, yes. 
Yeah. So I don't know where that fits into the uh, oh, editorial uh, process. <laughs> um, actually, actually, I know of one, and it's in. Uh, I'm going to say uh, it's. No, 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 Doctor J, you mustn't say it. That's no, no, I'm not going to say it. I'm not going to say Microsoft it. I'm going to say where it is. Off. <laughs> I, I'm not going to say it. It's it's along the run between the M1 and the M25, up just north of Slough. Uh, not not north of Slough, north of. Um, there's a run between the M1 and the M25 the that I do, and one of the stops there is a name that I don't read out simply because I look at it and I'm like, yes, that may be the name of the nearby pub, but I think we should probably change that name um, because it is relatively offensive. Um, it doesn't use the N-word, but it does refer in some ways towards the N-word. And I'm like, oh, that's not... Could we find another another name for this pub and this... Uh, and this is and, and this stop because that's kind of on the edge. Uh, yeah. Is there a stop not... called the Greg, Wa Greg Wallace? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Right. Moving <laughs> on. <laughs> Move on to him. <laughs> Very rapidly. Uh, um. So. Um. <laughs> uh, content management to display interface. So. Uh, this is the interface standard that allows you to take a display from one supplier and plug it into a different supplier's content management system, which does get into uh, using stop names and timetable information and all sorts of things. Um, over the past um, 18 months or so, um, the initial implementations have been carried out um, and as ever, that has flagged up some uh, challenges. As a result, uh, there's a working group working through um, what needs to happen to make the standard actually work in real life. Um, and so there'll be a new version of that coming out uh, early in the new year, if not just before Christmas, if I can uh, corral people enough um, between uh, now and then. Um, so yeah, so there's an update coming from that and that does play into accessible information regulations because in theory that can be also used for on vehicle displays um, and is proving to be a really quite useful standard um, and it's also being uh, uh, considered um, across a number of other uh, countries as well who are wanting to do similar things so Again, we're, we're paving the way with standards in the UK. Um, any questions about the content management to display interface? No. Nope. OK, um, EU standards development. Um, there's um, a lot going on with the standardisation of historical data um, and the format for that. that work uh, which we've talked about a number of times is progressing relatively well um the middle of uh, next year we will have uh the first xsds and things like that available um in the meantime there's a really interesting bit of work going on um to try and linked to uh, the historical data trying to produce a common glossary of terms that is used in European legislation um, and um, across um, public transport data standards to try and um, improve some uh, understanding and commonality of that. Um, it's a work of uh, love by a few people um, and, uh, and it's interesting how inconsistent European legislation is in its uh, use of some of the terminology um, but uh, but that's that's you know going to be a really useful bit of work when that's done um, there's um, some work about to start on um, vehicle data um, so at the moment uh, there isn't really a model for vehicle data so things like what speed is the vehicle going whether it's accelerating or decelerating um, how much charge is left in a battery and a cell within that battery um, and and works 
will start in January on trying to create a data model. So in a few years time, we will all be talking about um, vehicle data in the way that we talk about bus stop data and timetables and things like that at the moment, which has all been standardized for a good few years. Um, uh, vehicle data hasn't been. Um, Siri work is starting to prepare us for the next update to Siri, um, which will be happening next year. Um, I know the documents from the last update have only just been formally agreed by Sen, um, but the uh, but uh, the the technical work was done a couple of years ago. So um, starting work on that. Um, so things like control actions. Um, which affects cancellations and driver changing and things like that. A lot of operational stuff that's not passenger information related um, is going to be done as part of that. Um, and there's the European profile um, for real-time data that's a requirement for the um, MMTIS, Multimodal Traveller Information Systems uh, European um regulation uh no that's a directive actually um is just going through the approval process so suppliers will be doing a lot of work to implement that over the next uh few months um so that's good netex uh, is going to be a bit more stable it's had its update it will be stable now for a couple of years likewise trans model with the exception of the vehicle data um, elements of it a um, uh, lot of work's been done over the last couple of years to, to update the general model um, and the lady that has overseen that work Cassia Beret from France is retiring and that means that it's going to take a couple of years before somebody else can uh, actually really understand what she's done for the last 20 years with trans model and overseen that before um, <laughs> meaningfully uh, there can be too much change. So, um, yeah, the perils of uh, international standards and the reliance on, on a few individuals. Um, so that's what's going on in uh, European standards development. Uh, any questions? Dr. J, is your hand a historical hand? It was a historical hand, but I was mm. going to say, um, if we can get into the conversations on the accessibility ones, um, even just to present what we're doing with A plus Snaptan, so people have an idea of how we're meeting and beating their regulations um, and the model that we're working towards, that would be that would be interesting and possibly challenging and possibly mind blowing um, and very for 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 everybody involved. So a couple of weeks ago, I had a meeting with um, the lady that is responsible for um, MMTIS and NAPCOR X, which is so that's um, NAPCOR is the effectively let's sort out NAPTAN for Europe. Um, <laughs> X is the f project to progress that that's going to start sometime next year. And she was extremely interested in how we were proposing to use AI. Um, because if you think we've got a problem in the UK, um, oh. think about how many bus stops there are across Europe. <laughs> I'm also I'm also aware of the uh, challenge of planning a bus journey across a boundary in uh, in Germany, let alone ac across countries. So but they still so, don't yeah. have a national bus yeah. stop data yeah. set. Absolutely, so. I, uh, I, we've been doing uh, part of. ThoughtWorks has been doing some work with Deutsche Rail. Um, uh, Notice my very bad pronunciation of Deutsche um, and a uh, Deutsche Bahn. And um, yeah, we're trying to. Uh, they're amazed at the stuff that we're able to do. So yeah, I would love to be. I'd love to have a conversation, Tim, if you can um, negotiate. I will try and facilitate that. it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank yeah. you so much. I really appreciate it. Okay. Uh, right. Um, not a lot's happened with the bus centre of excellence that's worth bringing you up to date with so you'll be pleased for that um 
that then and and nothing is going wrong with data standards there's no problems with trans exchange and naptan and things like that because yet again there are no issues that have been raised we live in a perfect world it's lovely <laughs> to see i don't know what we've talked about for the last uh, <laughs> two hours <laughs> but nobody's raising any <laughs> formal issues <laughs> for resolution please do because uh, you know there is a way of raising these problems. I had a problem with a guy in a tuxedo falling asleep on me on the train. Can you sort sort that out? Uh, I I would have thought you might be able to sort that out yourself, but uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Somebody yeah, yeah. woke him up for me. <laughs> yeah, um, I have uh, proposed some dates during 2025 i think they miss um all of the industry conferences and events and things like that um and uh, we don't have two in june i have just seen um the uh, 18th of june should be september unless you want two in june <laughs> um so yeah i think they miss everything so uh if nobody spots anything then i will uh put them into event bright and things like that um and uh, and get the invites out okay um in which case that gets us to any other business nick any, I think this applies to anyone who works for a local or a regional authority on real-time information, um, but it stems from the work that Theresa and I have been doing uh, in Hertfordshire. And uh, Theresa did some uh, graphing of, of things that we're finding on BODs. Um, if you're, if you're a real-time information provider, you don't want to have to get running boards from every single bus operator in a region, a locality or whatever. Uh, you want to go to a central place. BODS is the obvious central place to go to. We found that certainly with, with uh, Ticketer uh, supplied, uh, if Ticketer were supplying the data to BODS, they were um, stripping out the, and, and, and David, uh, I think we escalated this to David, they're stripping out the um, block number perfectly reasonable thing to do because the block number at the time it is inserted by the bus operator into the running board is uh, is only a uh, a draft number that number is quite likely to change and does change in anything between 20 and 40 percent of cases by the time the uh, the running board is live so for those reasons quite correctly to strip it out. We've had very helpful conversations with the BODS team um, and they are well aware of this issue uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, it doesn't, it's not just Ticketer, anyone who's doing this would probably be doing the same thing, but it happens that in our, re uh, our area, Ticketer is the major supplier. Um, so it, it's a reasonable stance, but the question is how do we fix this and get the, uh, the, the, the three-way match between block number, block ref, and original timetable in order to do a, a reliable thing. And uh, we're on the scent. We're not there yet. We've had some correspondence with, um, very helpful correspondence with uh, Omni Times and uh, Omnibus, and uh, the same would apply if it was uh, Optibus or any of the other providers. Uh, and um, uh, they have a cunning plan in BODS as a, as a way to patch the data uh, and so that's that's where we got to, and we we hope we can succeed because we we believe that if we succeed in our county, it will it will potentially be a, a solution that can be uh, adopted nationally. Uh, please apply to us if you want to know more. Mm -hmm. Nick, tell the Nick Trust Scott this time. Yeah, so slight variation on that theme, but we had a. Well, we have a an operator who uploads data to BODS every week to take into account any changes to scheduling. 
um, which seems quite an excessive way of doing things. It really ought to be only uploading anything that's changed. Um, and we picked up on it because of the BODS data compliance report. They were getting to a point every quarter where they were dropping off 42 day compliance um, because they had hard end dates of when certain fixed sets of scheduling changes in their data. And that's how we uncovered that they were doing weekly uploads to get around this issue of keeping the block reference up to date. Um, yeah, it's not an ideal situation for sure. Yeah. Nick, sorry, Nick, I thought you, other Nick, I thought you were going to say yeah. something then. Um, I mean, that seems to be the, theoretically, the simplest solution at the moment. Um, I missed, Nick, just got what you were saying about what the compliance thing problem was, though, with that. The, um, so we have, because this operator was uploading data based on their scheduled operating period, yeah. when they got into a data set they were loading, which was due to end within 42 days, it was then oh. coming back up on the BODs um, services not in not correctly loaded in scope report. Oh, I see. The local authority report. So we were getting all these entries that these services have not got 42 day look aheads. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. But the so, bigger mm -hmm. challenge is keeping the block number up to date to enable a match with the ABL. And those Tell that are using it. Ticketer to Ticketer obviously is offering a service to upload the trans exchange while you're doing it to bots, which clearly on simple terms saves saves a, another job. Uh, but when it's stripped of block number, even though we had it before, uh, you can't do any matching because it ain't there. Uh -huh. um, uh, so it sounds like that. Oh, David. Mm. You had your hand up. You're ladies. on mute, David. Ah. Yeah, I haven't got there yet because you'll be surprised, Tim, in a minute. But I don't know if you can see. Oh, yeah. Very festive. <laughs> hey! Very festive. <laughs> Buses, snowflakes, and all sorts. Um, yeah, we don't update or we don't load the block to BODS because it's not mandatory and it's never been. So we we haven't done it. It's as simple as that at the minute. Mm. <laughs> Counter argument would be in the spirit of all we're trying to achieve around sort of matching data. Surely, as an industry, we should go, we should, we should be collaborative enough to provide, you know, sort of details on, on data sets that are, that go beyond the mandatory data sets as, as required by, by the DFT. Does that make sense? Yeah, so, it, 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 yeah totally. Um, I, I, I completely endorse that view. But actually, just to enlarge upon David's point, yes, it's not mandatory, but the point is the ticketer did include the block number uh, in 20 to 40 percent of cases, it would be wrong. Uh, and therefore, it is perfectly legitimate to to strip it out at the moment. Um, and I think the BOD solution, which is to take, um, which they're, they're looking at, we're looking at it with them, uh, is to uh, take a the ticket machine file. At the moment, it's a bit crude. It's a CSV file, but it is output by Omnibus, and, I, and they believe it's output by other timetable providers. If you take that file, they have a, a way, because they're cunning coders, of patching that into the operator or ticketer provided files and that could be the solution they can actually go into the zip files and patch in an updated ticket machine file okay i think it's it's a conversation i'll, I'll reach out to you for nick um yeah very happy very happy to help block yeah, number is not good. the only way to do it Say again sorry jonathan block number is not the only way to do it fuzzy matching yeah, I think we we're yeah. up to five five level fuzzy matching. That's that's indeed how it's working at the moment. But we found that with cross journey matching, uh, it it particularly of of late in the last two years, it's kind of browned out. Very happy to chat with you, Jonathan. Long time no speak. Okay, Mike. 
Yeah, I was I was just a bit surprised when you sort of implying that the block numbers are changing on a weekly basis because I mean I know operators change their running boards fairly frequently, but it's sort of normally sort of you know thinking of a, a smallish operator in Leicester, they change tend to change the running boards when you know like it goes from school holiday to school term time and yeah. and, and vice versa, yeah. but but not not on not every other week. Or, no, you know, but so. but if it, but they're absolutely right, Mike. But if you take say a Reva or First or uh, any of the bigger operators that the change it, it's a much more volatile data set uh, road closures is a big factor in that yeah 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 we're yeah. dealing in cornwall at the moment we've got anything between 15 and 20 disruption messages loaded in the bods disruption system at any one time and those mm -hmm. are those are the ones which are significant enough to involve generally involve some sort of schedule change yeah right yeah. right yeah. yeah okay yeah well yeah. I, i've seen i have seen that operator have had to reissue some running boards for, for road closures in a similar manner so yeah i'll I take your point on that yeah yeah, yeah. It's, it's 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 a never ending isn't it <laughs> i think the point is mike it varies and it shouldn't be it, it will depend on uh, operators location uh, way of working etc and it shouldn't be restricted by systems <laughs> uh, to do what needs to get done i guess yeah okay um that was a good discussion uh, <coughs> if nick you can talk to triumph and share what you know then yeah. that would be great um is there anything else If there isn't, I'm going to say thank you all for a really good set of discussions today. Thank you for your input uh, over the course of the year. Um, uh, a lot has happened and we've uh, we've dealt with a lot in this forum over the last year. Uh, so thank you. Um, and if I don't talk to you before, have a very good Christmas and a happy new year. Thank you very much, Tim, you. for your efforts yeah. and everyone's contributions. Thanks, Have a great time.